well, we can't talk about children with disabilities and all the resources out there without talking about how that relates to school. And that's what I'm going to be looking at very briefly. I only have 45 minutes, so I'm going to be talking very quickly, if that's going to be in order. Um, my name is Kathy Boswell. I'm a regional program specialist with MSOURS, Sioux Firth of Indiana Parent Training and Information Center. I'm up in northwest Indiana, a little further north. My coworker, Donna Roberts, her Superintendent Conan and the surrounding counties have attended Class B in uh, this particular presentation. Um, let me just go ahead and do some of the housekeeping issues here. I'm not an attorney. We don't we don't give legal advice. This is for informational purposes only. We, as a parent, absolutely have the right to seek legal advice if, if in fact, we decide that we need to do so. Just a, a quick survey. If you're comfortable, how many of you are parents of a child with a disability? How many of you are here in a professional capacity, either as agency rep? <laughs> how many of you are both? <laughs> you know, we, we tend to wear a lot of hats. I, I also am the parent of a, well, now a young adult uh, with a disability. <laughs> been out of school for a, for a few years, but I volunteered for MSOURS for 10 years before I became an employee, and I'm coming up on that in another evening, <coughs> so I'm starting to show my age here, folks, um, but, um, but I'm really glad that you could be here. I'm grateful for the opportunity uh, to be here. We're going to be talking this morning about Special Education 101. You should have, hopefully, when you came in, picked up a folder that says Angels on it. If you haven't opened it up to look around, I would I would encourage you to do so right now. You'll notice on the in the left pocket there is a couple uh, demographic forms. We're required through our grant to collect demographic information about parents that we work with, people that we work with, and it's the way that we're allowed to provide our services to is charged to parents and to the, the agency. So please take a few moments while I'm kind of doing the blah, blah, blah portion of my <laughs> presentation. You all know what I'm talking about, right? I have to tell you who I am and what I work for. So please take a few moments to do that. And then at, towards the end, there's a blue um, evaluation form. If you could take a few moments to kind of work through that. My coworker, Donna, will be collecting those. Also in the left-hand pocket, we have an online library. If you go to our website, insource.org, there are recorded streamings there, the Special Community Reading and Recovery, and I would strongly encourage you to, to look there. You don't always have to come to in-person training to get the information. Uh, it, it's all out there. On the right-hand side is the PowerPoint handout that matches, hopefully, my presentation. Sometimes they don't, <laughs> uh, but hopefully they're good for today. So please use this to jot down notes. Um, note taking notes is a great way to kind of reinforce learning. Behind that, we have an, an overview of the Article 7 IEP timeline, two pages or back to back, which I think you'll find helpful. We also have um, a back to back handout on reminders for parents attending case conferences. I call this your kind of advocate in a popular <laughs> review it, take it with you to your meeting to help you to remember what you can and maybe should be doing during some of your meetings. Um, I think I'm kind of laying the groundwork for, um, we've got a, a presentation in, uh, later this afternoon on the most important part of the IEP meeting, so maybe I can kind of put that framework in place for you. But I think these are very helpful hints. And then I have a little sheet of concerns and I strongly encourage my parents to use this as they are preparing to go to a case conference for their child, um, basically through, through the issues that you want to talk about. Now, as you can tell from the, the title of my presentation 101, mo for most of us, we understand that means it's probably gonna be a pretty basic presentation, and, and it is. Just a very, very brief overview of the process. For some of you, you may be very, very familiar with all of this and you may think, well, why do I need to sit through this again? Well, you know, I, I feel like, you know, you, you can never hear some of this information often enough to serve as a good review. Some of you may have had some experience. Maybe you have a child now in school with an IEP and maybe it's only been a year or a couple of years and you may find that I can fill in some of the blanks for information that maybe you just needed to know but didn't. 
I mean, for some of you, this may be your first one around the block, so to speak. This may be very, very new to you, but um, I'm, I'm hoping that I can maybe fill in some blanks, provide a little bit of information. Do need to caution a little because we have such a short time period. You may not be able to answer some questions that might be very complicated or involved. Please know you can talk to myself or Donna after the presentation or contact us by phone or email. Again, I, d I absolutely do want you to get your questions answered and I do want to address your issue about the social pragmatic language. So please, I if I'm, if I'll remember that at an appropriate point, but if I don't, I mean I know, okay? A little bit about InSource, we've been around since 1975. The federal IDEA law requires that all states have at least one parent training and information center, and that's what we do. We're PPI for the state of Indiana, our state chaplain. Our services are free to parents, and we're funded through grants from the Indiana Department of Education and through the federal government as well. We have staff that support every county in, in the state so there's somebody wherever you live, if you're all tippy from your county, come, we do day camps for the students. We may need to do some of the things that we do. We spend a lot of time on the phone trying to answer questions and kind of guide parents through the process. We do some things for the kids concretely. We do training, clearly, and I know this. We do webinars, we do all sorts of kind of fun, maybe not so exciting things, but that's what we try to do. And we are, of course, on Facebook. Please like us. I guess that's really, really important these days. <laughs> so if you haven't found us, please look for us. And again, there's online trainings that we offer. I know it's difficult to come to a physical location, especially if you have a child. And it's even more complicated if you have a child with disabilities. Sometimes the needs are such difficult to get child care or just to come <laughs> however. So you can always do things in your privacy and on your own time. Just a brief review of what we're going to be talking about. Obviously, the overview of the process itself. We're going to talk about the parents' role within the process because parents are a very, very important part uh, of the process and they are equal team members. And then perhaps the, the last one, that maybe I, that could be worded better, I'm going to talk briefly about some dispute resolution options. What happens when we don't agree? What does Article 7, Indiana Special Education Rules, lay out as the, the, the pathways that we can follow when we don't agree. Because parents and schools don't always agree, do they? No, no they don't. And Article 7 does address that. So in terms of defining special education, we're talking about specialized instruction, specially designed instruction that meets the, the unique needs of a child who has a disability so that the student can benefit from their education. This may be a good time to address your concerns. You notice the word unique needs? That's actually taken from Article 7. There's a section in there when it talks about de de developing the IEP that says that we have to consider the unique needs of a child regardless of the category of disability that they fall under. For example, 10 years ago when I was first really getting into this, I would go to case conference meetings where kids had a speech IEP, right? Maybe just a focus your own thing. Um, but this child was really, really struggling to read or to do math. And we would have the discussion about getting additional supports. And the response was, well, they're, I, they're, they're a speech only. We, we don't have to, you know, we don't have to address that. We, we can't address that. Well, that's actually not true. Article 7 says when you're developing that IEP, you need to address the unique needs. We're talking about social pragmatic, the child that's being ridiculed, perhaps even bullied because he's not getting the social language, he's not understanding. That's something that you need to write down on that little list of concerns <laughs> and take it to the school and, and be very specific examples of what's happening with him, what you're seeing. And at the school, you can ask the school to do an assessment, but he can get, they can work on social pragmatic. They can work on that speech to create the speech group. He doesn't have to have speech. What's that?
Right, that was certainly one thing that could be done, but you need to be asking them specifically, what are, what are you teaching them? How are you going to teach them to understand? Mm -hmm. Right, and so again, And I guess I would like to understand what their definition of bullying is. If in fact, no, that's okay. No, because that there is actually uh, Indiana has a very specific definition. We need to talk to them. That's that's not what the law says. That's not what I'm sorry. Boy, I really wish I had my bullying presentation. Yes, bullying prevention. Go to our website, incest.org. Yeah. And if you if you can't find that, you need to contact me or, or Donna, and and I will get that to you. So please talk to Donna. We that does that does need to be addressed. Okay. But the, the, the important thing is you need to work on a plan to take to the post conference meeting to address your policy and issue. Yes, ma'am. I never heard, yes, he repeated, more than once he's repeated, but I've never seen anything in the law that says by a same sex man. And there, there is a process, and I don't, I can't go into that right now. But I really need for you to talk to Donna. And by the way, on our website, we've done bullying prevention. I've got a recorded webinar where we talk about that. And if you want to know, in fact, we just did one last month, or no, actually, the 12th of this month, we did a webinar on it. And the information is there. So you know, either go to the website, watch the the archived webinar, or get in touch with Donna so we can start working. Working through that. Yes. We'll talk about eligibility for me. <coughs> I thought, and if I don't answer it, <coughs> she, you know, clearly or whatever, then I'm not talking. But if, if, you know, if I don't ask it again, okay? Yeah, that's certainly a possibility. It, it is a problem. It is a problem. And, and parents, you need to know what the law says because, you know, that gets there in that webinar. I have that question. And it's, you know, we've got the handout. We need to take this to the school and go through it with them and point it out, which is what Indiana's legislature says constitutes bullying. prevention month. <laughs> okay. Oh, and by the way, I went over it already, but the special education services are provided free of charge to parents. You don't have to pay the school for the occupational therapy or the special teacher. So this is a process, and we're trying to um, conceptualize this as a, as a series of balloons, and each balloon or circle represents one step in the process. This is how it's outlined in Article 7. This is Indiana's special education rules. That's what we follow based on the federal idea of that. And it, it all starts with a key to the kingdom. It starts with referral. Somebody has to make a referral. Somebody has to believe that something's not quite right with a child, that a child might in fact have a disability. The school can refer 
a child from the Valley Road Junior and leave the parents set up in the front court, typically schooling flurry with the parents. And so what I tell parents is, you know, you can make a verbal request, but verbal requests get lost. They, they do. They, they do. It, it, it just, it's just human nature. It, 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 it's unfortunate, but it does. So I always tell parents the other night, email and send them this book. You know, <laughs> it automatically keeps that record. It used to be you know, I'd say, write it out, make a copy, take one co copy to the school, keep one copy home. You can still do that. The email keeps the copy for you if you save it. <laughs> and uh, send it to, you can send it to your child's um, teacher or to your the building principal. You can send it to your spe local special education director if you choose to. But make that request. And you don't have to know what category of disability you think your child falls under. A lot of parents are making the mistake of, dis of, of requesting uh, a, a dis a, a, an evaluation for dyslexia. They've gone to an outside doctor who says, your child has dyslexia and the school needs to evaluate them. So the parent writes a letter saying, I want my child evaluated for dyslexia. And the school responds, we don't do an evaluation for dyslexia. I, I think that answer is a little disingenuous because dys dyslexia is in fact a type of a learning disorder specific learning disability and school needs reading right and so three years later the parents calling me and I'm explaining to them dyslexia is a learning disability do schools evaluate for learning disabilities yes they do terminology is important folks it shouldn't be and so three years later this kid's been failing for three years and that's some pretty hot parents some pretty hot parents and I'm wondering if maybe they might not even have a, 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 a denial of a free appropriate publication, a public education issue going on because for three years this kid probably qualified for services but the school didn't do child fine. If I, if I were the school, if any parent came to me expressing concern and whatever the parent called it, maybe I need to be looking at this. You know, I, I don't know every situation is different. So it's okay to say, my child's been failing math for three years. You don't have to say, I think my child has a learning disability, right? Yeah. So it doesn't have to be that specific. But you do need to maybe provide some, you know, some supporting evidence, and that would be, you know, an arrest for the last two or three years in math or in reading. There's something going on. Once you, the school has received your request, there's a timeline that kicks in, and that's why written documentation is really, really critical because the school has 10 school days are the days that kids are actually in school to review your child's records because they need to. They don't just take your word for it that your kid's doing poorly. They need to look at, at past grades, you know, the, the, vari the ISTEP scores, the various standardized tests that are done. They need that time to look at it, and then they need to decide hmm, maybe there really is something going on here. Or, hmm, yeah, that really, that really fails the child needs to be evaluated. And the school does have the right to refuse, but they have to tell you in writing why they're refusing, and you do have the right to, to appeal that. But for our purposes today, <laughs> just to kind of keep everything going, we're going to say that the school agreed to evaluate. They're, they're thinking maybe something's going on. They, again, they have to respond to you in writing within those 10 calendar days saying, yes, we will evaluate, and then they're going to tell you what, the, what those assessments are, what they're going to be looking at. They may ask you to come in to talk more about it in detail, get more de detailed information from you. But once the school has agreed, some, there's something else that needs to happen. Requesting an evaluation is not the same as consenting. So the school has to get your written consent at that point to evaluate. And once they have that written consent, they have 50, that's five zero school days in which to complete the evaluation, convene a case conference meeting, which we'll talk about shortly, and then determine is in fact this child eligible for FAPE.
of the behavior as she talked about earlier. You you're right. And schools sometimes don't don't do that well. They have a policy and it's easier to say this is black and white. When you're talking about kids with a special in special ed with an IEP, it's not quite so black and white. I think there are some gray area areas and maybe a meeting room is more that you know, you can hold every child in that school but some unique needs. But it needs the IEP. What does the I stand for in the IEP? Individualized. Individualized. And so that means it has to be individualized to me and individualized to you and individualized to you to meet your unique needs. And so you need to be talking, getting back to the table with the behavioral specialist and talking about the function of the behavior. And if you, when your child has a behavior plan, I'm pretty sure then the school district does need to do some um, revisiting. Everything, folks, everything, all of the decisions get made at the case conference meeting. And if you guys can hold that thought, I'm going to feel pretty good. And, and in fact, I think your speaker later is probably going to talk about that some more. But if it isn't in writing, it didn't happen, you need to come up with those plans during your meeting. And if you and your school are far, far apart and you're not coming together, then we need to look at some of the procedural rules in that case. What are your rights in terms I don't agree with this. What's the next step? Does that make sense? Okay. Is it not hard to do that when you have that many different people? It is. It's very hard. It's very well, hard. I mean, I think the big thing is that you can make it so much easier and make it easier for the district to work with the school district so that you work with the school district with the school district and not just the school district. But you know what? We can still be a good group, a good girl, and miss a group. I mean, we can. You know? But, it, but you're right, it's hard. You know, just because we disagree with people all the time, but they don't become our mortal enemy. And that. You get to know them as soon as you get to know them. And sometimes you just can do that. Yeah. We believe that you can do that. And in fairness, they believe that they are. And so when you have a differing opinion, understand, sometimes it comes down to a difference of opinion. Sometimes, but you've got to be willing to step up to the table and bring evidence to support why you think something needs to be done differently. Donna?
still have a lot of really good questions and I'm, I'm really sorry I feel like I'm cutting people off but we're going to be here till five <laughs> with, with me still talking I'm pretty sure the issue the other side came up appreciate that again once it, if it, once a school is used to evaluate you have to give written consent don't waste any time getting to the school to sign the paperwork okay because that starts another timeline five zero instructional days for the school to complete the evaluation and to convene a peace conference meeting to talk about eligibility. 550, you're getting busy school days, two and a half months. That doesn't include, you know, fall breaks, you know, if the kids are out of school, it doesn't. Once, if they've agreed, once you've signed consent, they have 52 days. Days kids are out of school. Fifty school days and to convene a peace conference. Sometimes I get them done earlier, but it takes a while to get it done, and they are allowed to do that. So, is it true that this is up in the high Pacific Islands? Mm -hmm. Is it a two day window that they can come out of school? Well, and there are things that you might be able to do, like a 504 plan. I I can't go into that, but I'd be happy to talk about that. Talk about those details. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think the Department of Ed would consider would expect it to be reasonable. I would think within two weeks. I don't know. I think we need to talk to Don. It sounds like you've got some issues that you need to work through. Okay. So get that consent to sign, folks. Don't dawdle. Okay. So the school's doing the evaluation. How many school days do they have to complete the evaluation and, and convene a peace conference after you sign consent? 50. 50, very good. How many school days does the school have to review your child's records after you've requested an IEP or, 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 or an evaluation? And before they respond to you, how many days? 10 school days. How does that response have to be given? Written. I'm, I'm not quite sure. I think it's five. Okay, so this educational evaluation, what does it do? In terms of, for first of all, within Article 7, there are educational definitions for all 13 categories of disabilities. The school's going to look at, does your child meet that the eligibility category, the definition contained, with artic contained within Article 7? First of all, is there a disability? And then does it meet the requirement? And so, the evaluation is looking at, you know, what your child can and can't do, and then eventually when you sit down at the peace conference meeting, you're going to look at what Article 7 says in terms of the, the, the definition for that category of disability uh, and determine does your child in fact meet that based on the results of the evaluation. So it provides information to the school and they determine what needs your child might have or might have. And then of course after the evaluation, you're going to meet and have a peace conference meeting. When you're signing consent for that evaluation, the school should be asking when they're preparing that and they're meeting on an IEP, I believe that asking if you would like to meet with someone to have them explain the results of the evaluation before your peace conference meeting. What response might you want to give? <laughs> yes, yes you do, because the first one I went to, I didn't have that and sat around the table and realized everybody had read the evaluation and back and stuff, and you didn't. <laughs> and I didn't like that, and you shouldn't like that either. The, the first time you hear these results should not be in a meeting 
different things that are open so that makes sense so and you can also request a copy a written copy of the evaluation i encourage parents if you're working with a psychiatrist a psychologist or a, a speech language pathologist whatever services you might be getting on the outside if in fact you are find those parents first and then vouch for them because they can give you some input too they also can be giving you an idea of what kind of a school might be needing in terms of what their recommendations might be. Okay? And it may seem that way, but you know, bottom line is the decision, the actual decision has to be made through three to five months from yeah, that meeting, in my opinion. Yeah, we're talking about something like three to nine months, right? Mm -hmm. Right, so it's kind of a long time. But that's why it's so good to see the results ahead of time because then you're going, hmm, yeah, I, I'm not sure I agree with this. And so then you have time to kind of find some supporting evidence of your position that makes sense? everything done within that first month plus the additional nine. And so if they're at day 50 and the parent is saying, I'm not coming, uh, that, that's going to be challenging. That's something you're probably going to have to walk up the, the steps and you can um, dispute resolutions because parent case conference meetings have to be held at what's called a mutually agreed upon date and time. That means it has to work for me, it has to work for you. And so you need to let the school know in advance, I'm off on Wednesdays, okay? Um, you know, if the school schedules it on Friday, as soon as you see that, you need to call them and say, I can't make that date. We're gonna need to reschedule. And you know, you, I don't, I'm not sure, if, as long as you're making a good faith effort to negotiate a, a time, I think if, I could be wrong, but I'm thinking if the school had that conference without you, I, I think you might be looking at a mediation. Yeah, but you said, I, I would go and I would say, no. And you can, you can. And schools can have meetings without you, but they have to document that they made a good faith effort to get you to the, to the table and you didn't respond, you didn't return a, a call. But if it's a difference of the school saying, we only have meetings on Fridays, and you're saying, I have to work on Friday. They can't, school can't do that. That's a concern that I would have. And you need that to make it a legitimate conversation with them. Mm -hmm. You're saying I have to work on Friday. Mm -hmm. You're saying I have to get that out to you on Friday. And then you need to be able to say, I have to work on Friday. That's what I need. And if you can't do that, I will say no. <laughs> we don't have time with you. Go to your meeting. Go to your day. participating in the process. And in order to participate, you have to be fully informed. We, did you, do you feel like you were fully informed as being given the results of the evaluation 30 minutes before the meeting and then kind of, if that's the case, then I, you could try filing a complaint with the Department of Ed and just ask for a do-over. But then to say, you know, we're not ever gonna resolve this, to say, I wanna have another case conference meeting for that. M maybe too late at this point, but at least file the complaint that you weren't unable to fully participate in the process because of the things that you were just saying. And even though they you know, requested the information previously, they provided it 30 minutes before, you know, you're, and also complainable if you guys, if the school's not allowing you to 
Again, I do think that there's, when you're signing a consent for an adult, oh, you're talking about for the case reference meeting or for the evaluation? going to these meetings and I'm not getting the information that I need to be fully informed. I'd like to talk about what information I require. Give the school a chance to provide it. And if they don't, then you do have the, the, have the option of filing that consent. But sometimes schools don't understand exactly what parents are wanting. And so take the time to really kind of flesh that out with the people of record and let them know, I don't feel, you know, I'm coming to these meetings and I don't, I don't feel like I've got all the information that I need. The other thing is, if you know they're pushing a meeting that you're not ready for, you absolutely have the right to say, I can't show up that day. What we need to reschedule it. You have the right to do that. But again, in writing, folks, in writing, through, through emails or however you know, however you can make that happen, and keep a record because that's appropriate. your district down here, you know, I worked through multiple ones up north, but I've never had a problem with the school accommodating uh, seeing the meeting that day. Well, well you can use the word And I'm all about problem solving. If I get find myself in that situation at a meeting where I'm realizing I don't have the information I need. You absolutely have the right as a parent to say, we need to reschedule this. I need time to process this information. So I've got no decisions get made, but no decisions get made, right? <laughs> right? And so if you need more time, you need more time, you do have the right to reconvene. Somebody mentioned those 30 minute meetings. I tell parents, talk to the school ahead of time and ask how much time you've been allotted. They say 30 minutes and you know you need more time. It's okay to say, I think I need more time for this meeting. I'd like you to schedule an hour or an hour and a half. And if we have to do it on a different day, then we'll, we'll work it out. But again, you know, be a little proactive in some of this, folks. You know, you, you know what they, you know, for me, when I was, when things, when things were always a good day for me. Can my sons keep their record? No. We need to take something off on Wednesday. If you know more, you work afternoon, so more, you need a morning meeting. Let the school know that ahead of time so that they can work with that. If you know your meeting is going to need more than 30 minutes, and it probably should anyway, but uh, you need to let them know and say, uh, you know, and again, in writing, I'd like for you to schedule an hour or an hour and a half. And, you know, bottom line, if you end up with a 30-minute meeting, folks, and you're not done, what can you do? Say, oh, well, go home, whatever. No. Do what? Call another meeting. Say, you know, I, you know, yeah, because they're saying, you know, we're, we've got to go. I've got, got the next meeting. Well, you know, I don't feel like we've fully discussed this with you. I'd like to re that we reconvene next week or that might have some value. Parents on the other end, but they know that you need
maybe we're taking it all on the house and maybe they should sell that house. <laughs> right, right. But they're not, as long as they're not beating you out the door these right. other towards the end about dispute resolution options and and you know I, I can address very briefly historically and why we see Lehman when we get to that point so you know you're right we, we don't agree with schools all the time we don't always like the way things happen but we do have rights and yes learning to advocate is a, is a wonderful way but m m my thought is to advocate doesn't mean that you have to you know be threatening people no. with you know but as long as they're aware that you know what your rights are, I think that automatically yeah. puts you. Yeah. You're right. You're right. You, you are right. You are absolutely correct. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about eligibility. Um, and again, I've mentioned, you know, a lot of people have, have disabilities, but just because you have a disability doesn't necessarily mean that you meet the eligibility criteria under Article 7. We have a lot of kids with ADD or ADHD. Really little monsters, aren't they? I can say that because I've got one of them. <laughs> but, um, but it doesn't necessarily rise to the level of creating academic or functional problems for them at school. You know, they may be a little bouncier than most, but you know, the grades are decent. You know, C's are fine, B's are average. You can't say, well, I want my kid to make A's, so I think he needs an IEP. No, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> But, so when we're, we're doing this evaluation, we're looking at, number one, does the child have a disability? And then, is it having an adverse impact at school? And if those two things come together, then your child, you're going to be, you, as a parent and the school, are going to make the decision. It's not just your decision. It's not just the school's decision. It's both of yours together making the decision, does he qualify? And if the answer is yes, then you're going to develop that individualized education plan. physical impairment that's affect, affecting the functional performance. If you have a child, for instance, in a wheelchair that needs a lot of physical assistance or a child with severe behavioral issues, that, that might qualify. But typically, schools, the first thing they're going to go to look at are the grades. Well, but it sounds like there might be some functional issues, some behavioral yeah, and so that, does he have an IEP currently? Oh, okay, well, but then he has an IEP, but, I, but we're assuming that his grades are okay because he's getting additional support through the IEP. Boy, we, we, sh we need two hours for this presentation. You guys have a lot of really good questions, um, but I, I, need to keep, I need to keep going here. I'm trying to get through it. Let me, let me move on. Are there additional categories of disabilities? 
developmental delay only applies to kids three through five who are not currently eligible to attend kindergarten in the legislature there is and i don't know if anything has happened with it they were talking about extending the age up to eight or nine which i think would be great but right now it's only three to five so your child has to meet the eligibility requirements of one or more or at least one of these categories in order to receive an individualized education plan. Make sense? So if your child has an IEP, they're, they're in there somewhere. <laughs> Hopefully you know which one your child falls under, okay? So developing the IEP, case conference committee develops the IEP. The school doesn't develop it, but they may give you a draft IEP at the beginning of your meeting, and all that is is a draft. That's the school's thought things through, and they're saying, well, we're thinking maybe these are some of the things that your child needs, okay? But the final, the final version will come about as a result of the discussion that you have at your case conference meeting. Does that make sense? Drafts are okay. Finalized version is your input. These are some of the people, these are the people that need to be there. Parents, you need to be there. You can attend by phone. That's not my favorite way to do it, but it's better than not being there, okay? Again, remember mutual and beautiful and during the time. Public agency representative, often it's the, the building principal. It could be a representative from your special ed co-op or, or however your special education programs are set up. The teacher of record is the teacher that has the appropriate training and or licensure in your child's category of disability or suspected category. Um, they could be an instructional strategist, and I, I'm not, I've never really seen an actual definition of that, but I'm guessing it's somebody that's a specialist in instructional strategy. <laughs> Generally, it's a teacher of record. It could be, you know, it could be the building principal, depending on their training, but somebody that knows how to develop um, an IEP and develop a strategy for teachers of record. Should be uh, a general education teacher, at least one, Unless your child has absolutely no classes in, in the general ed arena, if they have absolutely none, then a gen ed teacher is not required. But if you have, if your child is in any gen ed classes, then at least one, one of the gen ed teachers needs to be present at that meeting because you need input from them as well. Does that make sense? Um, and then others with knowledge of, knowledge of your child's needs that you could bring in a friend, uh, another family member, you could bring in somebody from eCourse or whoever you think will help you and support you in helping to develop a, an, an appropriate IEP. Thank you, Dr. Lee, I have one more question. Mm -hmm. um, in the initial planning piece and the district meeting committee discussion, mm -hmm. I saw you describe that it's very thorough and it has a lot of points of clarification. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that they all address some of the things you want to ask for in terms of protection. Yeah. And so you you describe it as all the gen ed skills in class potential? No. You need to use those as a category. What they're saying is if you have a, a child with, um, with a, a speech IEP, for instance, but he's struggling in reading. Okay, so it sort of looks like it could be a learning disability. Maybe it's not severe enough to meet that criteria, but what we have to do in, as a case conference committee is we have to look at that reading problem and say, is this something, is it severe enough that we need to address it? And we can then actually write in special support services, whatever, without him having a learning, a specific learning disability designation, if you know what I mean. And, but generally, it, you know, if it's severe enough and, or if they're doing some supports and it's not working, as a parent, you might want to say, you know what, maybe we need to do an, a, you know, a reading evaluation for a specific learning disability. In my case, with my son with a specific learning disability, that we realized that there were some, some communication issues going on when we ended up having an evaluation for speech. And so then he did, in fact, qualify under that as well, got some additional services, and worked his way out of it, which is wonderful. You know, so that's what you want. Yeah, so that's a good, um, so like even in that initial meeting when you get into that discussion of how to plan that, that initial project. Oh, yes. And then at least have those protections in place and make sure that it's kind of like in the back of mind a little bit so that you can get in that meeting and clear in your mind. I'm surprised they didn't evaluate him in all of those areas of his, I, 
I would have thought that would have been great information to have for stuff like that on your page. I mean, well, really. I, I would do this for It could be, it, it, yeah. I, I would just think that you you would have to do this for the entire business of your company. Um, or 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 I would say to do it on a custom basis. Person it would have been with your very first name, and it would be some if you're doing an I if you're doing a social ed event, you know. And Paul, call the school if you have your house. Somebody, somebody knows, or if you have an IEP, it'll be on your IEP. It'll tell you who the teacher of record is. So the information is there. You may just have to reach out and, 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 and ask. And, and during those meetings, make sure you're clear on who is who. You know, you can ask who's the public agency rep, who's the teacher of record. And if you don't know, you know, after a while you've, you've been at this rodeo several times, you, you've learned who the people are because you have to. But if you don't know, It depends, well, it, and there is a, a high rate of auto kids with reading issues. We have learning disabilities, but not all of them do. But again, your child already has an IEP, and so if this is your, what is that unique need that you're looking to have addressed, and how can we address it? And you do need to do a, a learning, dis a specific learning disability need evaluation on him. You know, we're definitely going to give us more information that we, that we need to, to write a good IEP plan. If the needs are being addressed, then you don't need to worry about it. But if you're concerned that they're not, then you need to explore that more. So again, everything is a case conference committee decision. If you don't know, ask. If you don't know, ask. Or you can go to our website. You can go to our website. All of those are recorded. You don't even have to come out in public. You don't have to come out in public. Heidi, you want me to hand over to you so we know where to come? We can certainly do that. But if you need information right away. Presentations tend to bring out a lot of questions because it's like, oh, I didn't know that. So what about this? And I, I get that. You know, I'm anxious to get my questions answered too. But I have a very small amount of time, and, and no, I don't apologize. But if you need, if you need information right away, folks, if you, if you're online, go to our website and go to training. We've got archived recorded webinars. We've got actual videos. That you can view. And that was in charge of the webinars, so they're really good. Yeah, yeah. 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 she's trying all the bad, but, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> I try. Well, you are. Okay. Um, Kathy? Yes. Is our, web, is our website on here? Insource.org, yes. Yeah, right there. Okay. Your yeah. back page. <laughs> and I like, I think it is. <laughs> they have a web, uh, webinar just for like general information. Oh, we've got webinars on lots of things. So you're better off to go look at it. Okay, great. And see. <laughs> so we also have recorded videos 
that you've been watching. And this webinar, we thought a webinar was a boring. Yeah, the videos are more fun. But um, 